Yeah, it's still a lot of uncertainty in the global economy right now. The geopolitical situation and the macroeconomic situation still present some significant risks and, and headwinds. But that being said, there's a lot of really exciting opportunities for patient and long-term investors who are selective. And when we think about some of, some of those in some instances, for example, like the energy transition theme is a, a great multi-decade theme that has had a really tough time over the last couple of years due to some temporary situations, which now feels like we're at the end of the, the, the bottleneck process around permitting and starting to see a lot of these, these renewables projects get back on track. And ultimately that's gonna result in accelerated pipeline for a lot of these companies we have exposure to. And um, that's one area we're excited about. Certainly when we look at um, the situations around both AI, generative AI and, and, and the GLP-1 drugs, you know, these are both really interesting areas where the market is extrapolating a lot of information, but a lot of these things are still very poorly understood. And that's going to result in some dislocations and some other opportunities. So obviously being very nimble and, and, and being able to look at these opportunities um, through a tactical lens is going to present some opportunities as, as well as good long-term opportunities as revenue streams may shift and there could be some really interesting things emerging there. Um, and then when we look at Japan as a market that's been a difficult place to be invested in for, for most investors over the last decade or so, Suddenly, you know, there's some really interesting opportunities emerging there as there's a resurgence in both productivity and, and uh, profitability within the Japanese companies. And a lot of the initiatives that the Tokyo Stock Exchange has, has implemented are really driving that. So, you know, those are a few of the areas that we're really excited about for next year and, and, and beyond. Yeah, I mean, the growth gap is really one of the most important things in all of our investment theses because it really represents where we're different from consensus in the way we're thinking about the projected future earnings. And for us, it's really having not just a, 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 the existence of a growth gap, but a roadmap as well. Um, that's how we hold our analysts accountable and, and ultimately uh, how we map out the milestones and we know whether our theses are working. But um, you know, that also, that, that concept of the growth gap and, and unanticipated growth really gives us a broad set of opportunities to play with across the market because we look at it both over long term and short term in terms of our core growth gap situations and these are those long term holdings where you know, roughly 75% of the portfolio is typically in this end. And these are the high quality compounders, they're typically companies that are earning uh, very good return on invested capital, well above their cost of capital, um, and, and that, you know, economic moat that they have is usually persistent in the way that they have reinvestment opportunities. So these are those you know, really well-managed franchises, good competitive moats, but we also have a, a portion of the portfolio of 25 to 30 percent on average that is opportunistic in nature and enables us to take, take advantage of some of those dislocations we talked about over shorter periods of time. And, and these can be growth gaps that might emerge from a company undergoing a restructuring, um, the market not fully appreciating an inflection in the cycle. Or, or even news flow that might create a shorter term dislocation where the market's not fully appreciating the earnings power over a short period of time. So it's really the combination of those two um, growth gaps that enable us to really capture a wealth of opportunities across the whole market landscape. For us, it's, it's really all about the bottom-up stock selection. We're picking companies first and foremost, and then we're, we're managing our risks at a top-down level, more from a, a risk control standpoint. So the overweights to Europe and, and, and UK are less a reflection of our macro view on either of those markets from the top-down perspective, but more a reflection of the opportunity set and the companies that we're finding. So we've got a lot of great positions in healthcare and industrials that are driving that overweight that we see will be really beneficial in the coming years. Yeah, ESG is more of a framework. There's, to us, there's no such thing as an ESG company, quite frankly. It's more about a framework for thinking about the non-financial factors. And for us, it's a way that we build and develop conviction in the companies by thinking about that stakeholder lens and that stakeholder framework. I mean, ultimately, no company operates in a vacuum. They all have both positive and negative externalities that come through their operations. And having a deeper understanding about what those might be and how those might affect the earnings growth and the trajectory of earnings over long periods of time is a really important part in, in how we build conviction. But equally, as we go through these companies, in, and I think it's important to clarify when we talk about these things, we don't take any exclusionary lens towards any company or industry. Um, we want to have an understanding of what the risks and the growth map look like. And in some cases, you know, that might be either supported or challenged by some of these ESG risks, and that's going to be built into our models. 
but also understanding those and how we engage with those companies is also a really important part of how we unlock value. As active owners, I mean, we see that engagement process with the companies we're invested in is equally important in the way we manage, protect, and enhance our clients' assets.